Welcome, I'm Lucy Bernholtz. I'm the president of Blueprint Research and Design, and this is the session on using social media for social good. I'm joined by Lila Jana of Samasource and Chris Hughes of Jumo, and we'll be talking both about their specific, uh, the work that they do with each of their organizations, and uh, also uh, leaving plenty of time for questions and conversation for all of you. This is really, um, I'm here to sort of prime the pump, but uh, this is really set up to be a conversation about the role of social media in creating social good. So just um, by means of one minute of introduction, uh, I get this wonderful task because uh, I wrote a report last year called Disrupting Philanthropy, which makes the claim that data are the new platform for social good. Uh, I think Tim O'Reilly said it much more eloquently than I did. But when I look around the world at all the different ways we're using a variety of technologies from the internet to mobile phones, uh, what we're really doing is talking about connecting people to data and using people as data, letting people be those data sources, whether we want to or not, as Tim was talking about in terms of the GPS capacity and following you in the phone. And Chris and Lila have both created organizations and uh, platforms that are really doing some remarkable work. Samasource is a uh, innovator in the field of micro work. In fact, I'm told they coined the term. So we'll be following up with The Economist for their use of that term without due credit uh, in last week's issue. And Chris has uh, launched the platform Jumo.com, which is a platform to connect people to the issues and organizations they care about. So with that, um, let me actually ask each of you to do a better job of explaining the work you're doing and just give us the the two-minute elevator pitch on Samasaurus. I'll start with Lila and then go to Chris. Sure. Uh, so as you all know, there are four billion people around the world who live on less than $3 a day. And very rarely do we regard these people as producers in the global economy. What Samasaurus does is, is give poor people what they need most, which is dignified work. Uh, so we operate a technology platform that takes big data contracts from companies that include ask.com, Google, Intuit, and various other internet companies, we break down these tasks uh, into micro work, so these small units of work, and we farm out those tasks to people living in poverty, over a thousand of them in 10 countries, uh, primarily in East Africa, South Asia, and Haiti. And we've actually contracted about one and a half million dollars worth of micro work and paid out over $800,000 to these workers since we started uh, two years ago. Great, and Chris, tell us about Jumo. So um, I've always been really fascinated by the problem of, of uh, people who want to have an impact on the world but don't know how. And it's not because they haven't uh, been relatively uh, curious and interested in different problems and in different spaces, but they have, the dots have never been connected between that desire to help and the uh, connection to an organization that's already working on the ground and doing good work. So. Um, with Jumo, we've created a network that helps organizations themselves tell their stories online. And so as we enter an age where the, uh, the old sort of brochure-like um, one-to-many model of the website uh, grows old, we're trying to provide the, a platform that enables a group uh, to have a social and dynamic presence on the web where a person can come, discover, interact, discuss, and eventually support that organization um, without, uh, uh, with, uh, with their friends at the, location, at the location with them. And so um, we've gotten about 15,000 organizations signed up. We are a platform. We don't have a particular ideology. We don't have a particular program. We don't have a particular region or uh, anything like that. Instead, we want to enable both domestic and international groups uh, to use the platform to, to their advantage. So these are, I mean, remarkably different uses of internet technology. Um, and the theme of the conference here is turning points. So as I was um, reading and checking out both of the sites and learning a little about this, the question that kept coming to me is, why now? What is it about now that makes this the moment for Jumo and the moment for Samosaurus? Chris, why don't you? Yeah, well, I mean, so for Jumo in particular, I think um, there's an incredible amount of interest in helping organizations. But whenever we do find organizations that are interesting to us, it's very difficult to uh, know if they're good, know if our friends support them, know and, and know the work that they do. 
So Jumo enters the picture and tries to make it very easy to get to know an organization um, in that first initial interaction, agree to follow it, and then know the stories of the people that it's serving on an ongoing basis. So in a lot of ways, you can think of what we're doing as replicating what has been a very long-standing offline donor model, mm -hmm. where a group would um, find a potential donor, they would take them out to lunch, they'd maybe take them later on a tour of the facilities, have them meet a beneficiary, sit down and have a coffee, and then by the eighth, ninth, tenth interaction, then they would say, you know, we'd actually love your support. Uh, we have uh, this, this amount of work to do, we need to raise this amount of money, or we need this, uh, this resource, um, and we'd love, to, uh, uh, we'd love to have you participate. So at Jumo, it's the same idea where an organization has all of their content from Facebook, from Twitter, from YouTube, from their blog, consolidated into a single place that's distributed to uh, their followers and their supporters on an ongoing basis um, with uh, the idea that those followers will then eventually convert into donors, volunteers, activists, or whatever, whatever they need. It's a paradigm that um, while there are a lot of people who are working in this space, only 3% of the $300 billion that's given each year to nonprofits uh, transacts online. Um, so it's, it's, no one's really cracked the model here, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we're, uh, we're working on it ourselves. Great. I'm going to come back to that. But Lila, tell me what it is about this moment in time, technologically, socially, economically, that makes something like Samosource so robust. Well, it's, it's really exciting because um, it's really only been possible to do what we do you know, in, the last, in the last three years. Um, as we heard on stage earlier today, communication technologies are now pretty much ubiquitous. They, they will be, I'm convinced, ubiquitous within the next five years. I just returned from Sierra Leone and Liberia and saw computer labs with satellite internet connections in rural Sierra Leone, which has no grid power. And, you know, and, and so it's everywhere. I think Maslow's hierarchy got it wrong. I think at the bottom <laughs> rung is actually, is actually connectivity and connection to the people around us. And so, um, so with 4 billion cell phones in the world, with 200 million laptops and netbooks sold last year alone, and with Moore's Law driving down the price of hardware incredibly every year, we've just seen, um, we've seen an explosion in communication technologies in the poorest parts of the world. And what that's allowing us to do is to, uh, is to view the bottom billions of people as producers for the very first time. Previously, you needed all of this infrastructure to, say, build a factory in order to employ people and engage them in the global economy. Now, the factories of the future, we argue, are digital. I can put, you know, we, we actually set up a center in, in rural Haiti, in the Central Plateau, which is a pretty poor place in a town called Mirabale. For $20,000, we set up a technology center with 50 tiny $200 netbooks. And people in that community were able to do work for a technology company that needed translations done of text messages from Creole into English. Now just imagine that. Could you imagine building a factory for $20,000 in a rural part of Haiti? It would be impossible. You would need roads to bring in raw materials, and you would need you know, good shipping, and you would need a customs official who wouldn't hold up the orders. And now we can circumvent all of that with ICT. And, and so, so what, what this enables in, in my mind is for us to regard this whole mass of people as producers for the very first time. Talk a little bit more about that, each of you, because what you've both mentioned then is the role of connectivity. You're talking about the ability to aggregate and pull together all the different ways organizations are online, but still help people make that connection to an organization that, that cares about them. But you're talking connection in two different ways, both from uh, Intuit or a client here to a workforce in rural Haiti or somewhere else, and locally. Talk a little bit about particularly the connections that are made locally and what's happening. Uh, you mentioned earlier that it was really a reinvention of economic development, this micro work. Talk about those connections. Sure. So um, what happens locally? We, we get a lot of people who are very skeptical of our model until I show them pictures of it happening, because the idea that somebody could be using a computer to do work in rural Kenya or rural India is, is uh, outside of the realm of possibility for many of us. So, um, so the way our model works is we identify local entrepreneurs who already run internet cafes, computer centers, computer labs, small data entry businesses, and we empower them to be micro work center operators. And we train them in how to use our platform to recruit uh, workers to do this kind of work. And so, so that's kind of how the model looks, looks in the field. 
Um, and, and in terms of the implications for economic development, I spent some time at, at the World Bank um, where I learned that the only thing that development economists could really agree on was that what brings a poor country at a macro level out of poverty is trade. It's trade with a richer country. But what tends to happen is that the benefit of that trade accrues to elite people in that poor country because those are the people who have the resources to trade with, with the rich world. And very rarely does that wealth, or um, you know, some might argue um, that it, it often trickles down, but I think it ra rarely does. Very rarely does that wealth trickle down to the poorest people in the poor country. What technology enables us to do is to get around that problem by allowing poor people to trade directly with wealthy countries. And that's essentially what's happening with Samosource. We're, we're allowing people to skip all of the steps in between of having to trade their services up to a middleman who works with another middleman who works with an exporter. Um, and we, you know, we've got rural workers in, in Jharkhand doing work for LinkedIn. And there's only one step in between, and that's, that's Samosource. And we're, we're a nonprofit so that we never have the incentive to take a huge, a huge mm -hmm. cut out of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. I mean, connection works a little bit differently for yeah. us, and it might even be good to take some source as an example of where I think you know Jumo, um, the potential of Jumo lies. Everyone in this room, let's say you're just learning about Sama Source today, you know, it's a pretty incredible concept, which is um, a proven model, and you know, is is something that I have a feeling most people uh, would love to to support or be interested in sharing. Ten years ago, or you know, in a pre-Facebook era, if you wanted to do that, you would either have to compose an email and get to a point where you wanted to send a note to you know, 15 of your friends, which would really be a huge way, uh, a huge endorsement for an idea. Or you would have to call up your friends one by one and say, hey, there's this new great group. I want to tell you about yeah. it. So with Jumo, you come and you can find and discover, whether it's Samosource or one of the other 15,000 organizations that we have on the platform, then the interactions that you take with the organization there um, are automatically displayed to your Facebook friends, to your Facebook acquaintances. You can share it out on Twitter. You can use whatever social media platform you prefer to use, but you can immediately sort of become uh, a person that vouches for an organization that recruits your friends, your acquaintances to support it too. And then hopefully, the more that you get to know the organization, um, you convert into a donor or, or an activist. And so what we really search to, to see happen is to build these connection technologies that enable people to do that, whether it's for a group like Samasaurus or whether it's a, the, you know, a local homelessness organization or a group you know, working in India on healthcare or, or you name it. So connection for us really is, is less about the peer-to-peer, -peer, someone sitting here to someone else in the developing world and more about um, the capacity for a person to get excited about a cause and share it with the people that they know, they trust, and, and are likely to care about it as well. And it's more than just amplifying those, that voice. I mean, uh, sending an email 10 years ago, I think there are people in this room who probably remember doing more than sending an email, but using a pencil on a piece of paper and writing an invitation. And uh, I certainly do, not to, to <laughs> point to anybody else. But there's more than just that you can do it faster and broader, isn't it? It's the connection, is there some fundamental difference in the kind of connections that are being built? Through technology, yeah. through technology in general? Um, I, I, I wonder, I wonder. Um, if anything, I th one of the, the, the downsides, I think, is that you know, technology, because there's so many different opportunities and there's so many um, different things that, that we're excited about or friends are excited mm -hmm. about, I, I worry that it becomes a bit more of a superficial interaction. Mm -hmm. And so I mm -hmm. think we have to be um, really careful and really diligent as we build these technologies to make sure that it's not just, hey, look at that shiny new right. new cause or new thing, go vote for it, and then never actually come back and never right. actually develop a relationship with it. So um, I think that structurally the technology sort of favors mm -hmm. that superficial interaction, which mm -hmm. places even more responsibility on us as collectively as people who are interested in these things to make sure that we mitigate that and build technologies mm -hmm. that, that, that really truly deepen relationships. Mm -hmm. And also for the users then to make that realizing that in a system like this, we're both accessing external information, but also becoming the filter and the credibility source about that information, which I know is very yeah, important in the way Samasource works with its workers, is that the technology actually allows not only a different type of work, but a whole different set of relationships about quality and the 
the professional development, if you will, the career path for people doing this kind of work. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, you know, one of, one of the worst things about being poor is that you're largely invisible. Um, first of all, you have no reputation history professionally. Most of your work is informal, and if you do a really good job for an informal employer, um, that reputation doesn't carry over anywhere else. They're not writing you a LinkedIn recommendation. <laughs> There's no recruiting firm that's calling and, and asking your references how you did. And so it's very hard to ever move, move out of poverty because you can't build a path. You can't use your experience and, and grow on top of that. And, uh, and additionally, you're missing um, a lot of the, um, the great benefit of being visible on the internet, um, even on Facebook, as more and more people are starting to use uh, Facebook and LinkedIn to, uh, to look at um, to look at people that they're going to hire. So, so you're just totally invisible and absent from this world. Um, and so a couple of the things that we're doing at Samasource aim to address that. One is that most of our workers get on Facebook and we're starting to get them on LinkedIn when they join, which is a really big deal for people who've been told their entire lives that they're not worth it, that they're not, you know, they don't deserve to use this fancy uh, technology and that's designed for rich people in the West and not for them. Um, so we've seen them start voting for the first time and get really empowered, and I think that has a lot to do with them being on the same platform as, uh, you know, as, as you and me. We have some workers who even friend our staff on Facebook and, uh, and say, you know, because of Samasource, I now connect to the world and I have a reason to get online. Um, from a professional perspective, and we've been talking to a couple of, uh, of large websites that deal with reputations uh, to see if we could partner on this front, but we've started aggregating data on individual worker productivity. So uh, the number of tasks they're doing, the nature of the tasks they're doing. We just developed a taxonomy of micro work uh, so people can kind of move up a ladder. So they'll start off doing the most basic data mining mm -hmm. work and then very quickly they'll get bored of that and they'll want to do uh, content generation or stuff that requires uh, more, more thinking. And, and at the very top, we're hoping we can graduate people into doing quality assurance work and potentially even going off and running one of their own micro work centers as, you know, as a franchise. So we've really tried to build in this notion of a career path um, in, uh, for workers who, who have previously been denied that in the informal sector. So both of you have talked about the way technology is changing access to information, the credibility and source of that information, the, the role of our connections both to people we know and to people we don't know. Two other big um, issues in philanthropy that it seems are touched by what you've been building are the issues of accountability and transparency. How do you think about that at Jumo? Well, I think that, I mean, just on a structural perspective with technology, um, the opportunities now for um, for everyday people to weigh in on the quality of, of a program are, are significantly amplified. I think you have to be really careful, though, in the social sector not to just rely on something like um, donor reviews, for mm -hmm. instance, to um, gauge the the, uh, the the quality of a program. You know for a lot of different reasons. I think that when it comes to impact assessment, doing impact assessment for a, a program in the developing world is completely different than doing impact assessment for a symphony. And technically they're both, you know, uh, uh, either C3s or NGOs are part of the social sector. Um, so you have to be really, really careful about, uh, about uh, talking about impact assessment depending on the vertical that it's in. But in general, having more people who are um, watching a program and are able to talk mm -hmm. about a program um, on, on the internet, on whatever platforms they use, is I think a healthy thing for transparency. You know, I want to get to a day when uh, we can see a school or a program that is on Jumo and somebody can go and snap a photo of that classroom and have that be uploaded directly to that mm -hmm. school's uh, page on Jumo so that the people who support it can say, hey, that's great, look at those kids, they're learning that day. Or in the case where there's not school in session on a <laughs> Tuesday morning, when there should be, which happens all the time, mm -hmm. unfortunately, in programs like this, um, then that's exposed too, mm -hmm. and that um, a donor or an activist um, would, uh, would know. So um, I think there's, a, there's immense opportunity there. So in addition, in that example that you just gave, that's both a, a different kind of transparency, if you will. There's many more eyes on the work that's happening, but it seems to me there's also a different kind of accountability. 
Because if I trust a recommendation from you and it turns out to be uh, uh, you were selling me a, a bridge in swampland, um, I'm going to want some way to hold you accountable. Isn't, is, so that's also part of the equation, yeah, possibly. Absolutely. absolutely. What about for, for Sama Source, these questions of accountability and transparency? How are you seeing that play out in the system you're building? Well, I think, um, I think Chris makes a really good point, which is that technology enables us to view these organizations more holistically. In the past, there was this obsession with overhead, right? And everybody was like, what's the overhead around your nonprofit? And that's really missing the point, because what you, what you should care about as a donor is the leverage of your dollar, right? So what is the total operating cost of the organization, and what does that buy the organization in terms of impact, in whatever way it's measuring impact, in terms of you know, dogs saved from the street, or in our case, in terms of dollars paid out to people who are living on less than $3 a day before they started Samasource. And, uh, and for us, it enables us to very clearly examine that for ourselves. So the metric that we'll soon be sharing um, more publicly on our website, because we finally aggregated all this data, <laughs> is um, what is the total operating cost of Samasource um, versus the amount that's been paid out to workers. And that, that, that number will be dynamically updated. So you'll be able to know, you know, for every additional donor dollar, this is the marginal impact on a, on a worker's income. And every organization that, um, you know, that, that purports to be about poverty alleviation should really be reporting how many poor people were, help moving over, were, were helping to move over the poverty line and by how much each year. Otherwise, we're, we're not really fulfilling our mission. So you've got a metric that's been generated pretty organically from the way you're doing your work. And you can share that publicly. And it might even become some kind of new a benchmark that others might, might look at. How are you going to measure what Jumo is accomplishing? Well, we're interested in helping people measure the organizations and their, their impact assessment. So again, in being a platform that works on a lot of different issues, there's mm -hmm. not a single metric. You know, I think in this space in general, we all want to search for the single number, or um, which it has been the proportion of administrative right. costs to the rest of the organization, which doesn't necessarily reflect um, reflect effectiveness. And so, um, for us, the responsibility is to uh, make sure that organizations see a direct reward. The more that they disclose about uh, their work, and mm -hmm. the more that they can talk about the metrics that. Uh, drive their their success, or they use to, to measure their success, the more likely they are to receive attention and to receive the, the support of the community. Again, though, th there is, um, just as before, in the days before the internet, the <laughs> groups, you know, groups can put a lot of effort and a lot of emphasis into marketing. And it's right. important to realize that even though we have these new technologies where you can snap that photo and there is a new level of transparency and accountability, there's also a new level of, of, of branding and marketing opportunity mm -hmm. that works just as much on Facebook as it would have worked, um, or anywhere on, on the social web, on Gmail, anywhere else, as it would have worked elsewhere. Okay. So um, you know, we're not in a period where, just because the technology exists, the transparency and accountability is, is number, uh, uh, naturally dominant. Uh, marketing and, and branding still, still really, really Still matters. works. Yeah. <laughs> And there's still, I mean, there's, a, again, a responsibility for those of us using it to recognize the, the role we play as those, those filters, it sounds like. You mentioned earlier, Chris, that uh, only 3% of the $300 billion that's given in America is being transacted online. But it seems like every time I turn around, someone else is launching another website to help me find the organizations I care about. How does Jumo fit in that ecosystem? I mean, is, or is, it just, is this a moment where we're just going to see a proliferation of these kinds of sites, and then there'll be some kind of consolidation? Are they, all the I sites so. working together? How, does this, how do I make sense, not of the organizations, but of the sites that are helping me find the organization? I hope we see a proliferation of people working on this problem. I mean, it is, it is a really big, uh, it's a big problem, not just upping the percent of dollars given online over offline, but helping people find meaningful organizations, develop relationships with them, and be more um, uh, civically and globally involved is something I would love to see a lot more experimentation and entrepreneurship with. I think, you know, particularly in the social sector, there's a, a huge barrier for uh, nonprofit startups uh, to exist at all. If you go out there as a for-profit, there are capital markets, whether it's angel investors or venture capitalists, you can raise you know, a few million dollars worth of startup capital off of a very basic idea, particularly in this economy, um, really easily. 
Whereas if you are a 501c3 or you're not for profit and you want to get something off the ground, um, the, our whole world of foundations and, and donors isn't yet used to um, the, whole, uh, the whole idea of, of sequential experimentation, trying mm -hmm. out different ideas and seeing mm -hmm. what works. We're still you know, very focused. The language I hear used most of the time is very much about programmatically. Surely you just want one, one uh -huh. player in a space so that nobody else gets in there and, mm -hmm. and messes, up, messes up their cause. Or actually, I think we want a proliferation, so it's a competitive mm -hmm. space um, that has a lot of people working on a problem, hopefully, who can learn from successes and, and failures. That's mm -hmm. certainly my hope, personally. So, that, Which is an interesting thing to flag. It may or may not be um, uh, an offshoot of the technology, but an idea that, in fact, kind of the old trope that there are too many nonprofits. It may be is that what we need is a system in which it's easier to try to solve these problems, more people are engaged, and that comp competition spurs better solutions. As long as there's a graceful way for nonprofits to quote unquote go out of business or, or merge, which is you know a huge, huge asterisk in, uh -huh. in this entire conversation. And so um, you know, I, I think having a, a more competitive marketplace is a good thing as long as it's truly a marketplace uh -huh. and that the foundations and donors really are truly evaluating the effectiveness of these right. groups and are making a decision to right. not look at the marketing brochure, look at the numbers right. and then decide whether or not you're going to fund it. That's an asterisk that probably won't be solved with technology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, in, in creating Samasource and moving into this micro work uh, or bringing micro work to, to the forefront, um, how does that ecosystem, what is the ecosystem for Samasource? I mean, are there other micro work providers? I mean, you've got both the, the ecosystem of nonprofits, but this is a whole new domain of work, digital piece work for the rural poor. Who else is out there? How are you learning from who else is out there? How does that ecosystem affect what you're doing? Sure. I guess the, um, the most significant component of our ecosystem is the market. Um, and, and we look at the market as far beyond what we what we call micro work, or it's also called you know, human intelligence tasks by Mechanical Turk. And there's a bunch of different uh, terms for this work. But it's essentially the lowest rung of business process outsourcing. And business process outsourcing is a $1.3 trillion industry. It's enormous, because it includes everything from really basic data entry and you know, keying in the numbers that you see on a purchase order or an invoice or an insurance form all the way up to high-end financial analytics, um, which you know, some of the investment banks are doing now offshore mm -hmm. in, in parts of India. Um, and so if you just look at the lowest rung of that sector, you're looking at really $300 billion or so um, of addressable market and stuff like data entry. And, it, and if you actually look at the way these processes are architected, a lot of the work is quite basic in nature and can be pulled out of a more complex process and broken down into these tasks. So I guess that's the first thing to establish is that there's a huge market out there, and it's much larger than um, you know than than fair trade coffee, say, or a lot of the things that poor people are traditionally told they should focus on in terms of, of industry. Um, the second piece of this are, are all of the providers, and I share Chris's view that the more the merrier. Um, we currently have uh, have more for profits in this space than nonprofits. Um, there's only there are only a handful of nonprofit organizations that are doing this type of work. One, um, which was the initial inspiration for Samasource, is called Digital Divide Data. They're based in Cambodia, and Tom Friedman wrote about them in his book The World Is Flat. And I, before starting Samasource, I went to the founder of Digital Divide Data, and I said, I really don't want to start another nonprofit. Can you please help me? I just, <laughs> I just want to take your model and move it into Africa. And he said it wouldn't work. So I was forced to start Samasource. <laughs> um, and uh, and so, so there are a couple, there are a handful of organizations like, like Jeremy's, um, which are nonprofit data entry shops around the world. There's another called the Anudeep Foundation. And we've, we've seen the proliferation in the last two years of for-profit crowdsourcing companies. Crowdflower, and there's a division of Amazon called Mechanical Turk, which does this work. And um, from my perspective, we're now directly competing with these guys on deals, so it's, it's heating up a bit. But from my perspective, that's great. And I think that um, right now, we're in such a nascent stage in the industry, the more people who are talking about micro work, the more articles that are written mm -hmm. about it, even articles that don't reference you know, sound <laughs> source, they help make, make me much more legitimate when I go and I pitch businesses. Because now, you know, hopefully, the client that I'm meeting tomorrow will have read that article. And when I say micro work, he won't look at me with a funny right. face. He can walk in there with a copy <laughs> of The Economist. <laughs> 
So the micro and micro work, how does it relate to the other micros? I'm sure this audience has heard a great deal about like microfinance and micro franchising. Is it is it a different micro? It's a different micro or a different? It's a very different different yeah. micro. Um, and so I will say before uh, before I remark on that, um, I think microfinance took us so much farther than where we were before. Um, so nothing that I, I will say is intended to disparage microfinance. However, I think that viewing it as um, as you know the be all and end all solution to poverty in the developing world is problematic, and here's why. Um, essentially, what microfinance does is it um, creates a stream of capital to fund local small services businesses, goods or services businesses, and the clients of those businesses are also people who make under two or three dollars a day, right? So microfinance is funding, you know, tailoring shops and uh, fruit stands and those types of, of businesses in poor countries. Now, um, if you help a guy who runs a local tailoring shop uh, sell a bit more product because he can increase his inventory, um, you're marginally improving his income, but probably you're not going to see a level change in his income over time, and that's because his entire customer base is also really poor. So uh, we're micro in the sense that the units of work that we send out are small, but we're macro in mm -hmm. the sense that the market that we're going after is very large. If you think about a number like 300 billion, you know, you need a tiny, tiny fraction of that to really measurably improve the lives of millions of people. Mm -hmm. So if you can figure out an efficient way to take a small amount of this incredible wealth that's within a 30 mile radius of us sitting here in Silicon Valley and allocate that efficiently to poor people for work that they've done, uh, you know, all of a sudden you create this whole new channel for wealth creation. We have, we have women who run some of our centers who've bought iPhones, actually that's just one, one woman bought one <laughs> iPhone <laughs> with, uh, with the income she made from Samasource. We have some rural women in India who are primary breadwinners now in their families in, in, uh, in this region called Jharkhand, which is a desperately poor mining part of India. Uh, we have people in sub-Saharan Africa who've never had formal employment before who are supporting five people in their family. So this is a whole new channel for wealth. Well, the other thing that you're a living example of uh, that I know, uh, again, the, over the 10 years of the Global Philanthropy Forum has been a frequent topic of conversation, is the, is the mix of commercial enterprises and not-for-profit enterprises possibly addressing the same issue or seemingly addressing the same market but going at it with a different way. Tell us about your decision to be a nonprofit and how that is the distinctive in the choices that that were out there when there's clearly a commercial marketplace for micro work. I had a, a big argument recently with a guy from SKS. Uh, actually, he's from Sequoia, who invested in SKS, um, and they had just exited. And he was sitting at this like really fancy bar in San Francisco, which I had driven to in my beat up old Miata, and uh, <laughs> which he had driven to in like like literally like it was like a Tesla or some really expensive <laughs> car. And he was uh, he was criticizing me for being a nonprofit because he said you'll never scale. Um, and I just looked at him and I said, you know, governments are not for profit and governments have scaled pretty well. <laughs> and uh, big relief organizations and humanitarian organizations are not for profit and they've managed to scale. So I don't think there's anything sort of inherently mm -hmm. scalable about uh, the for profit model. The one, you know, the one thing that it is easier to do is raise a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and however, that money comes with strings attached. And those strings are that you have to, generally, you have to pay back investors a pretty big return, or you have to somehow convince them that you will <laughs> in five <laughs> years, right? And so, uh, um, and so if you believe, as we do, that there's a lot of business opportunity in the break-even or just above break-even mm -hmm. or just below break-even space, right? Businesses operate across a spectrum of profitability, and a lot of them, even those uh, you know, that are for-profit, maybe unintentionally, end up being non-profit, <laughs> many of them are, are, are break-even businesses, right? right? There's a lot of opportunity there, and it's, it's Jacqueline Novogratz's concept mm -hmm. of, of patient capital. Right. Um, so so all, all you know, we argue is that as a nonprofit, we're better able to make our trade-offs on the side of helping poor people than on the side of being really profitable. We want to break even eventually, you know, too, but we're not going to uh, we're not going to make the wrong decisions um, and reduce the social impact that we're having in order to to create an extremely profitable business model to make some investors rich. And and that's fundamentally why we're by the one three. Chris, do you have thoughts on this, having had experience in both the commercial social networking space, the social network for political purposes, and now building a social network for 
for causes? How, how do you yeah. think about these different sectors? Yeah, well, I, I would echo uh, almost everything that, that Lila said. I think that there's this expectation that you have to be a for-profit to, to scale. And while I do think it is easier to do that because of capital availability, um, I also think that you know we've, uh, particularly in this area of the world or in the in the technology and, and startup sector in general, I've come to expect that every idea should be a business that is able to become a hundred million dollar business in five years. And it turns out that a very very small portion of ideas, um, even for profit ideas, actually um, meet that bar. And there's a lot of good charitable ideas that um, can be self sustaining and very efficient. From uh, from a revenue and expenditure standpoint, but aren't going to be you know a business that venture capitalists should be even backing. Um, so you know when it came to Jumo in particular, um, my approach was: Are we doing this for money? Or are we doing this to help the world? And of course, you can do both. There are lots of of, of flourishing double bottom line businesses. But I never wanted to sit in a board meeting and have an investor say, "When are we getting?" to $100 million next year in order to mm -hmm. exit? Or when are we going to start thinking about acquisitions or you know, public offering? There are some ideas that are so elegant and are also charitable that that totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. Jumo is not, not we, we don't have any intention to bring mm -hmm. it to that scale just for the sake of that, that, that dollar sign. Instead, we want to have one focus and one focus only, which is providing this basic functionality to people who want to be more engaged with the world around them. So it, it ended up being a pretty pretty easy decision for us. So I'm going to turn it to the audience in one second, but since we've traveled across the entire theme of the conference here, <laughs> from technology to different <laughs> kinds of financing, different kinds of enterprise, um, I have to ask the, the key technology question of the moment, or I'll probably be fired from my moderator job. Where does mobile fit into all of this? <laughs> Um, so there's a company called Text Eagle, which is really interesting, which was formed originally um, to help people do these kind of micro work tasks on their mobile phones using SMS or USSD, which is a different protocol which takes less bandwidth from the carrier. And, um, and we experimented. We actually talked to the founder of Text Eagle, and, and we're trying to get some contracts for him in the early days. We realized that it's, it's, it's actually very hard to do work that companies are willing to pay for using an SMS interface and make the economics work. Um, because the economics of SMS, you know, cost a couple cents to send mm. them and receive them, and the work itself is usually worth less than a fraction of a penny. Mm -hmm. So, so that's problematic. So, um, so Text Eagle ended up pivoting and is now doing surveys. So they're surveying developing world workers on the mobile phone. We think that we could use mobile in a different way. Mm. Um, we can use mobile to manage the workforce, to manage the workforce and to pay them. So imagine a world where we had a sea of digital day laborers who received a ping when there was extra work to do. So around tax time, Intuit has billions, probably, <laughs> billions of receipts that they need to digitize. And the, the volume, the, the demand is bursty. So it's not you know, every month that they have the same level of demand. And so what if you could ping hundreds of thousands of workers on their phone and say, hey, come in and go to an internet cafe. And uh, maybe you could even test them on their mobile phone to see if they're capable of doing the work. Um, and once they are capable, they go to the internet cafe, they do the work, and then they get paid that same day on their phone. Um, so, and we've seen this model applied to manual labor. There's a company called Suktel, which uses mobile phones to tell youth when there are construction jobs available. There's another firm called Baba Job in India that's doing this for domestic workers. Mm -hmm. So we think we could easily translate that model to, um, to internet-based work. And we actually just got right. a grant from Cisco to do it. So, great. Yeah, that's stay great. tuned. <laughs> what about mobile Jumo? Um, <clears throat> I think mobile is most exciting to me when it comes back to some of the um, transparency and accountability mm -hmm. issues um, for donors who are in the field and who are engaged, but also for um, beneficiaries who um, can report back whether a well is still operational uh -huh. and helpful five years later, right. or whether or not through just a simple question, you know, that goes out to everyone who's part of an education program, you know. Um, uh, has this education program improved the quality of your life or your mm -hmm. ability to get a job? Yes, no. You know, there's a whole sort of, of, of set of opportunities um, around impact assessment um, where I think mobile is is most um, is most exciting, um, and the consumer angle, or right. you know, for transparency's sake, is is pretty cool too. Really, in terms of being able to get information directly from the people who are theoretically benefiting, I think mobile yeah. is one of the that's one of the 
places we'll see the most interesting. Yeah. And there could be a huge opportunity for mobile giving, too, if, um, if the Apple Store would change its policy and allow people to give <laughs> through... Okay. Since uh, Apple got through... one plug, we'll, we'll now dis Apple. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now it's your turn. It's um, just crazy. Uh, we've got a hand in the back here, please. I think uh, if you'll stand and just uh, identify yourself for the hi. recording. Yeah, hi, my name is Asha uh, Jadeja. I'm from the Botwani Foundation. And uh, I had a question for actually for both of you, uh, which is um, that I just got back from India, Laila, and I just, uh, you know, I just ran into a little startup that's doing, uh, that's hoping to do Android smartphones, Android, Android based smartphones for very rural areas, very cheap phones uh, for rural parts of India. I mean, do you see kind of, you know, where something like some of source would, would fit in if people had smartphones and, you know, maybe didn't even have to go to a PC or something like that? That's one question for you. And the question for you, uh, Chris, is that is if there was, um, I'm wondering if you had, uh, you know, something like a video, right? Cheap video kind of a facility where people could see a school or something so live, you could just mm -hmm. click on it and see where are the classes going on or something. Would you, I'm wondering if that would be something, streaming technology that would, you know, would be a kind of a dream technology for you guys, for, for your, you know, for your clients and your, yeah. your want to come to have. Yeah. Sure, so to answer your question, yes. <laughs> it's entirely possible to do our work on smartphones. If you can open our, um, our platform in a browser on a phone, you can use our platform, and we probably have to make some modifications to make the user interface better. Um, right, I've tried using it on my iPhone, it's, it's pretty terrible. Um, so, so the only thing I was saying was that SMS is really hard to make mm -hmm. work just because of the economics. They just don't work out. But if you have a cheap internet plan, for example, um, a telco in Sierra Leone, I think it was Sierra Leone or Liberia, told me that they're rolling out a $12 a month data plan for students. Um, it's not a lot of data, it's like 150 megabytes, but still, if you can, if you can uh, remove the image-related tasks and just have tasks that involve text, that all of a sudden you know, becomes an economical right. solution. Right. Yeah, and on the question of, of live streaming, I think you know, for us the challenge is to um, see, the, see groups that might be doing something like live streaming and then tie it directly to better performance metrics. So you know, the schools that have a live stream of their classrooms they're able to um, to share that uh, share that on Jumo or you know on another platform. They have twice as many followers and maybe three times as many donations or something like that. Because what we run into time and time again with all of the groups that that are on Jumo and that we serve is um, they're interested in all this technology, but they want to see the ROI. And particularly for something that would be something like a, um, video streaming, where there's a, a significant level of investment. You have to show them that um, show them that upfront, and so mm -hmm. you know some of our priorities and what what we want to work on in the next few months is converting Jumo followers into Jumo activists and Jumo donors, so that there's even more of an incentive, not just the eyeballs that are already at, on the platform, but the resources, the money, um, so that organizations can um, can understand the value a little bit more a little bit more easily. Y yeah. Absolutely. Any any group with a social mission um, can and, and sign up on Jumo. So C3s and GOs. You know, uh, we have a ton of organizations which are two people who are working on HIV education and then you know Kibera. You know, or you know, uh, um, we, we have all different kinds of all different kinds of groups that can set up a page um, after just answering a handful of basic questions and immediately have a name, have a domain. It's like a website um, out of the box for a lot of them, which you know, for the groups that can't pay a consulting firm 10 grand to make their website is hugely, um, is hugely valuable. Okay. We got a question in the back, and then if I can get a mic up front, please. We got these four. Hi, I'm uh, April Donellan from Global Philanthropy Partnership in Chicago. Um, a question for Chris. Does Jumo facilitate communities among the NGOs that are participating? In other words, if there are NGOs that are all working on girls' education in Africa or uh, that are all based in Chicago, for example, yeah. and working on global issues. Yeah, this is one of our, our, one of our strategic priorities for this year is we now have, and we just launched about four months ago, and so we've had this incredible influx of people come in and set up pages and, 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 and set up um, 
profiles. So we're now actually sitting on, by some accounts, you know, the most up-to-date database of you know, thousands and thousands of C3s and NGOs that, um, that is um, you know, uh, accessible in real time. And so we've got to better organize that data, not just for ourselves, but even more importantly, for the people who are using Jumo. So right now, you could go in and you could search you know, whatever the key terms are homelessness, Chicago, or whatever, and you could find a few groups, but um, we could easily um, organize and will organize that information so that you can actually see you know, all 15 groups that are working on homelessness anywhere near um, Chicago or whatever the issue may be, um, which is still, even after, you know, um, uh, you know, even after all this time on the internet, it's still really, really hard to find. So that's one of the things that we'll be working on. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's already that's already possible. Like, you can go on and you can um, connect with people who run uh, run an organization right off right off the bat. Yeah. So, a couple of hands right here, please. Hi, I'm Colleen Lafontaine from One World Children's Fund, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have a question for Chris. Um, how do you level the playing field on GMO for the organizations that don't have the bandwidth, the resources, access to electricity? Um, in order to maintain those relationships online? Are there resources to support them or, or they just don't get to play? Well, you have to have electricity and you have to have a computer. Or consistent, to start. let's say, like, so but, you mentioned Kibera. Let's say there's a, yep. a school in Kibera yeah. and they get up there, but they don't have the, the resources to be online all the time. So this is exactly the type of problem, that, or not the type, but the problem that we're trying to, to solve. I mean, the expectation pre, um, the expectation previously was that they have to come up with a website that is, you know, one static thing. They do it once and then they're done. You know, it's not up to date. It doesn't tell stories of people. It, it's not interactive. It's not at all. It's very hard to promote it, all of those things. With Jumo, you come and you create a page once and then, you know, then anyone who's interested in what you're doing. So it could be a direct supporter. It could be someone who's just interested to follow this, to follow this example through. Someone who's interested in HIV education in Kenya in general or someone who's interested in everything that's going on in Kibera can come in and create a story on that page, participate in a discussion about it, tweet it out, share it on Facebook, use any of the tools that exist, um, that exist in the platform, and already existed all over the web, but weren't consolidated in one single location. So all of that activity can continue to happen even if that person who runs that organization, or you know, even just shell of an organization, isn't directly online and constantly monitoring um, monitoring their profile. So um, you know, it still requires some basic connectivity, but hopefully less than than the than than the static website that was the paradigm before. Other sites, though, where the more you're on it, the higher you come up in results, or the, the broader the content, the higher you come up. Is there any kind of leveling? Yeah. So the way that we do it is everything is customized for you as an individual. So what you see on Jumo this afternoon will be completely different from what I see. And it'll be completely different from what Lila or anyone else out there sees. And it's based on two factors. One, what you're interested in. And two, what your friends are doing. So um, it's absolutely true that the, the content that has the most interactions will naturally surface to the top. But if you are specifically interested in that group in Kibera, and even if nobody is uploading videos or talking about it, you'll still get updates about that organization side by side with what it, with you know the most important topic of the day, which you know will very much depend day by day. So um, you know we try to structure it so that we rely on the wisdom of the crowd, but don't go so far that we forget you know who you are and what you're what you're personally uh, personally interested in. But it's it's a work in progress. You know I mean we're just a few months in and we have a lot of a lot of work to do. So. <laughs> right here, please. <laughs> to say the least. Hi, I'm Stephen Kahn uh, from the Abundance Foundation. Uh, Chris, it seems like if you're relying on the wisdom of the crowd, it seems like a perfect opportunity for uh, donor education. If someone identifies that these are the fields that they're interested in, um, wouldn't that be a perfect opportunity to, to have people, instead of responding to a crisis, prepare for the next crisis? Because probably there's pretty consistent themes of yep. where donors need educating. And um, I mean, I can imagine that there's the potential to say, well, we don't want to overly bias. But um, you know, toward one organization or another, by providing. But there are organizations that I know. Global Health Delivery at mm -hmm. Harvard is just coming out in the next few weeks with case studies that they've you know 
put a, put a lot of work into um, to analyze different organizations, um, and it seems like there's external sources that could actually provide really good donor education for those individuals who are willing to dive deeper and learn more, yeah. and then share that with their friends. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, for the moment, we don't have the editorial expertise to know that even for you know if we even if we just did global health or which is even almost a, a meaningless term because I mean even if we just <laughs> did let's say um, malaria work or um, TB work or something like that even the expertise that's required for me to be comfortable to have an editorial voice on that is really quite high and given the fact that we you know I mean we have groups everything from um, the you know big groups like Nature Conservancy to these small groups that we're talking about to advocacy organizations here domestically in the U.S. like Planned Parenthood. You know, there's such a wide variety of organizations that we have on the platform that we haven't started really embracing any editorial voice outside of making occasional suggestions um, to users um, because it is um, such a complicated uh, task to, to take on. Instead, what we try to do is help the experts in this space come on Jumo or use, not just Jumo again, but use their own social networks wherever they're interacting with the web to promote that content and to sort of um, pick up a megaphone and use that so um, to the people who care about it. So to follow the, for what you're talking about, global health, we've got global health, I think there's like 10,000 people on Jumo that follow that issue. Anybody can come in this afternoon and the people you're talking about at Harvard can come in this afternoon and create a story on that page, start a discussion going and then promote that out to the rest of the web to get those interactions, um, get those interactions helping. So, um, for the time being, we don't have any, any, any editorial voice and are relying on, um, on the experts to do that. And it's a, I mean, it's an open platform, so, um, you know, So just as, as you talked about the role that marketing might play for some organizations, it's also open enough that the advocates or the sources of information, for example, uh, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that if you've got research from Harvard or the Peer Water Exchange, for example, which has all these vetted water projects that might want to start a site on Jumo, a page on Jumo that yeah. could add that information. It's actually you're crowdsourcing that independent information as well, is what you're saying. The Absolutely. platform is, is neutral. You just need to find the platform. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there was a question here and then a question in the middle. Oh, and I skipped someone. No, you were not. I'm sorry. You had your hand up. Yeah. Sorry, Jacob. Since we're all global, I'm Paula Gentrico. Um, since we're all interested in investing globally, hence GPF, um, I'm curious about how much information you have on Juno, Jumo, about 501c3 versus nonprofits and their representation by fiscal agents in the United States. Because it is an issue and it is onerous to try to qualify them. Yeah, um, the answer is very, is, is very little. I mean, we, um, if you're a C3, we ask you to provide your EIN, and um, a little bit less than half of the groups that are on are C3. Um, but we don't have a good sense of, of who's using what fiscal agents and how they're um, going through the process. Um, we just sort of require a, um, the groups themselves to self-identify. If I might interject, I am. I'm on the board of a tremendous organization called TechSoup Global, which recently merged with uh, GuideStar International, and the CEO of TechSoup Global is in the back there, Rebecca. Um, and, and they now have one of the largest repositories of information about nonprofits um, and philanthropic organizations globally. So I recommend checking them out. I'm sure Definitely. Rebecca would be happy to give you a walkthrough. <laughs> right here, please. What's that, TechSoup Global? <laughs> Rebecca, put TechSoup Global on Jumo. You have 15 minutes. <laughs> you can do it with your mobile phone. And Sama migrate sources. the data for you. That's yes. right. <laughs> exactly. I like that. Uh, my name is Jin Seidel, and I'm the founder of Blue Planet Network. And, uh, the Pure Water Exchange, which uh, Lucy just mentioned, is a project of ours. 
And since I am technically challenged and is barely past the chisel and hammer stage, uh, <laughs> Lucy, I, I would like to address the question you and you can answer. Uh, or they can answer it. Or no, okay. actually you. You know what we do. You know what they do. Is there anything that we have in common that we can <laughs> oh, I'm serious. I don't, know, I don't know how to make a succinct uh, question. You know how. So is there anything they can do for us or we can do for them? So my third harm here, um, the Peer Water Exchange is actually a uh, online system of vetted uh, local water projects um, uploaded by and vetted by peer water organizations, um, fundable water projects. So um, <laughs> how do they connect to what you're doing? Um, it seems to me back to the question about uh, external expertise. If Jumo is really an open platform where anyone who's interested in an issue can identify the organizations they care about and upload additional information, there'd be an easy way, just like it would be uh, an, an interesting li link to the TechSoup global database, would be a link to the Peer Water Exchange database. And I know from my own um, experiences on Jumo that it's already connected to Issue Lab and GuideStar and a lot of these other back-end sources. So in a way, it's taking the distributed nature of all of this information, and at least from the perspective of a small nonprofit providing one place where all of that information can come. Mm -hmm. is that, is that, that's the best I can do, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the question is, um, it's, it reminds me sort of the question uh, like 10 years ago, why should we have a website? Yeah. You know, and I, th well, there's a, lo there's a lot of reasons, but the main ones I think are to put your face forward in a place where people are gonna look for you. And in, particularly now in sort of the second, what I would consider the second era of the web, to um, encourage conversations and, uh, and be able to listen to the people who are interested in what you do. And in some cases, talk to them, in some cases, hear what they have to say, and hopefully have a stronger and healthier organization as a result. I mean, that's like a very top line sort of theoretical thing, but um, I think um, those are the real reasons to you know, adapt to not just Jumo, but to think about you know, a, a very sort of coherent or cohesive, I should say, um, social media strategy in general. If I can um, direct a question to you, Lila, then as someone running a nonprofit that needs to be visible in as many ways as possible, how do you handle the entree of a new platform like Jumo and all of these choices, all of these different data sources there are for donors. How is that working out for Samosaurs? Uh, well, I don't get a lot of sleep <laughs> is one answer, uh, nor does the guy who does our social media. Um, well, I, I actually think, uh, to Chris's point, that the chaos is, is really helpful. And we find that when people uh, go online and they find our profile on you know, TechCrunch, and they find it on Facebook, right. and they find our Twitter page. Um, having a lot of different touch points is a really healthy thing and a, and a healthy way for our donors and supporters to engage with us. So we're super excited about Jumo. And I think, um, you know, one of the, the biggest reasons I've heard for not giving in our generation is that it's too hard to figure out which organizations to support or which organizations align with me and my interests. Mm -hmm. And people in the Facebook era are used to, um, are used to, these really simple connections they can make online. And so I think facilitating that for nonprofits um, is a, will be a great benefit to our sector. Other questions, right? I'll, now I'll come back to Jacob. Uh, thanks, Jacob Harold, uh, Hewlett Foundation. Good to see you all and um, fantastic discussion. I, I will take exception with one point though. And it's this idea around chaos being good, which I generally think is good. And I generally agree that the more the merrier is wonderful. There's one exception, which is platforms for social change. Because there needs to be a platform for social change because there's a market failure, something's not working. And then, but you really, but for a platform to be successful, it has to have a critical mass. So I would actually argue in the online giving space, the fact that there are 63 platforms by our count has created immense confusion among donors, immense confusion among nonprofits, a lot of wasted effort. And that until we can figure out to bring them together, you know, even if it's two or three, that we're not going to be able to reap the success, which is part of why I, I hope that Jumo is successful. But um, don't you think that 
out of those 63, there may be some that are better than others, and that some maybe will fail, and that that's a good thing, and that the best will rise to the top? Well, yes, but it turns out that they don't seem to actually ever fail. <laughs> that's the, that's <laughs> the problem. Well, that's the, the death issue. That's the issue. Not, the death not of the a nonprofit issue. problem. And, and, but see, the thing yeah. is that you have to, we have to calibrate our approach and our expectation to the reality of the way that economics works. And there are, there's not a natural roll up. So the private sector, eBay begins to get some traction. It starts to acquire smaller rivals. It gets big and it's successful. The same thing doesn't happen in the nonprofit sector, which makes it all the more important that we figure out how to kind of weave the platforms together. There's a if I go ahead, please. Might, no. uh, one more point. Um, there's a program in Africa. I forget the name. Somebody here probably knows about it. Um, I can't believe I'm saying this on stage. Um, they actually uh, will pay leaders to step down. Right? What is that called? Somebody. Well, we yeah, funded no, it, right? Yeah. And so somebody mentioned that we should do that in the nonprofit sector. <laughs> I don't know what they were trying to get at with me, but um, I, I, totally, I, I totally agree. You know, um, a lot of our board members um, are venture capitalists, and VCs uh, expect a 40% failure rate in their investments. Um, it's just planned for, right? And, uh, and yet, VCs are still in business, right? So we need to have that same tolerance for failure, and, and not just tolerance for, but, um, but hope that we're investing in enough things that some of them will fail and some will succeed, and, and I think creating a nice exit plan for, uh, for startup nonprofits that aren't going anywhere would be a good thing for Hewlett to work on, maybe. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, the mic moved to the back, but then we'll come up front again. Oh, there's two mics. Wow. Uh, there's a question up here, and I, I thought you were taking a hand back in the back there, Amy. Sorry. Hi, I'm Patty. <clears throat> Excuse me, Patty with Vita. And I can speak to that, all those platforms, because I do the marketing for the nonprofit that I volunteer with, and I'm constantly trying to stay on top of I don't, over a dozen different platforms and trying to tweet and trying to do Facebook mm -hmm. and trying to do causes and trying to do global giving and Kiva and so on. And um, I really am at the point where, do I need to step back and wait and see who wins? Mm -hmm. Because I can't do it all without um, not doing a good job, mm -hmm. you know? So maybe, yeah. go ahead, please. I mean, I think there's, there's no question. I mean, that's the thing about the fact that we have these conversations online now is that it can, I mean, it not can seem, it actually is overwhelming. I mean, the amount of information that's produced, I mean, just if you just take Facebook alone, and not just in the social sector, but in a given day, or the, you know, there's billions and billions of photos. I mean, it's just an immense amount of information. So I think that at least the way that I think about all these platforms and all these different places is, you know, 20 years ago, before there was any of this uh, connection technology, lots of people were having all these different conversations. But they were never documented. And lots of, of organizations had no access to those communities whatsoever. And now, so, much of, so many of those conversations are documented and are tur turn into information, um, and it's possible to reach into them. So you know, I don't think that, it, that from a nonprofit expect perspective, I would ever expect um, you know, a group to be in every single conversation, in every single place on the web. I mean, it would just be. Um, insane. I think being strategic about what are the platforms that um, line up with the people that you're trying to reach as donors or maybe beneficiaries, I don't know exactly what your, your group does, um, and what are the platforms that have enough distribution that it makes sense, and just focus on those. You know, I, I would never, um, I, I think um, trying to be in all places at all moments is just never, never going to be feasible. <laughs> Pre baby tuna. Yeah. They've got done nothing. And I yeah. funded them to get the funding going and you know, yeah. to be an active participant and they're nothing. They're nowhere. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this is what social marketers, you know, not just in our sector, but in all, I mean, if you do this for a big brand or a small brand, I mean, they're, everyone is sort of facing the same questions. The web is so big and there's so many platforms and there's so many conversations, there's so many people. How do I know who's going to win? Right. Or but, how do I know where, what's most valuable? And you, you don't, I, I don't, I mean, I don't think anybody knows. You just have to sort of make well, the educated decisions. <laughs> <laughs> And Causes does something pretty different than, than, than Jumo. Causes is, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a 
it's a specifically a fundraising application that exists inside Facebook. So you know, it's a place where you go to find a, a group to donate, or if it's your birthday, you can uh, raise money for it. You know, we're trying to be a platform for groups that, that enables them to have a social and dynamic presence on the web. And those, so those are the organizations that are ultimately the, the groups that we're trying to serve. So we're in sort of the same general field, but just as Facebook and Twitter, for those of you who use both, are completely different platforms, so too are we. So we've faced the ultimate turning point question here, and I'm getting the five minute mark. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Lila and Chris to, to close us out with a, their thoughts on the turning points that lie ahead. But it seems to me to this question of how many social media platforms for giving can the market um, bear, part of the difficulty of that question is who's got the leverage in the market? Is it the funders who create these things, the donors who use them, the nonprofits who need to populate them? And it's a complicated, it's not an, a one-to-one -one relationship here, and it's not clear who's going to have that kind of, the, that key force at the end of the day to drive anybody out of business or just keep them hanging on um, so that you can figure out who will be the clear leader. With that, I'll ask Chris and Lila each to just comment on the question of the turning points theme of the conference. Given what, what you know about technology, what you've seen work and not work, what do you see ahead? What, what's the next most exciting thing for what you're doing and where that fits into trying to make the world a better place? I mean, I, I would say the general trends um, in the sector and also for us as people who um, in the social sector in particular, are the intersection of mobile and, and social. I mean, um, it's a good thing I, asked that question. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> that, you know, if the fact that five billion people out of seven have, have, um, have phones is a really important data point. I think 10 years from now, how many of those people will have smartphones? And what will that mean for things like microwork? Um, I think it's a whole different, um, different paradigm particularly when you layer in just the idea that we could have a web, and we are increasingly living in a web where we are our real selves, connected to our mm -hmm. real friends, and mm -hmm. not just on one site, but across it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost um, it's a web that I think looks so different from the, the past 10 years mm -hmm. that it makes sense to think of, it, um, think of it differently. So I think those are the directions we're moving in. Thanks, Lila? Um, well, Sama, Sama is Sanskrit for equal. And uh, we chose that name because we really wanted to change this us versus them mentality that we have with poor people, where you know, they're on the receiving end of either charitable contributions or you know, in the best case of multinational products that we make and they buy. And for the first time in history, we have the power to engage with poor people on a level playing field. Um, the internet is, I believe, going to facilitate a global meritocracy for work, where people will be valued for their output and not where they happen to, uh, you know, to win, or where they happen to um, uh, uh, land in the birth lottery. And so, so I think, you know, when we think about the the promise of, of the internet, it's not just about information, you know, sharing information from here to there. Um, it's about creating um, engagement and, and uh, a work superhighway um, for the people who, who need it most. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Join me in thanking Chris and Lila.